All right, folks. Hey, welcome back. John Kelly with the Law Enforcement Life Coach Sometimes Heroes Need Help podcast. So I got Chris Yates with me today. And you're going to say, hmm, Chris Yates. Chris Yates. Yeah, he's from New Zealand. Yep. New Zealand. Yep. And you know what? He is coming to the U.S. of A. And so he has been doing some amazing things for the folks, not only in law enforcement in New Zealand, but just people in general, man, mankind. And he's addressing issues with your why and burnout and how you live this thing out, uh, being the best version of you. So we're going to talk about what he's been doing, uh, tap into some of his insights and see what this whole thing is about and how we can be better incrementally day after day. So without further ado, help me in welcoming Chris Yates to the Law Enforcement Life Coach, Sometimes Heroes Need Help podcast. Brother, it is great to see you. It's great to see you as well, man. I will just uh, clarify one little thing. It's actually Chris Chandler Yates hyphenated. My mom what? will get very grumpy otherwise. Oh, um, <laughs> I was thinking, you know, that that was uh, that was throwawayable, bro. I mean, just like uh, nah, the, the not first for, not for second, her, but that's, that, that's all good, man. It makes a conversation, does it? Chris Doesn't it? Chandler um, Yates. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. So um, I saw yeah, no, it there. I thought it was a typo, bro. You know, don't you just worry getting... about it, brother. All don't right. you worry about it, brother. It happens all the time. My dad will be happy because he's the Yates of the of, of the Chandler Yates. Yeah, man. Um, I don't but... want to be making any enemies with your mom, bro. So <laughs> yeah, she's 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 feisty, man. But no, no, right. nah, nah, it's all good. So yeah, so I'm Chris Chandler Yates. Uh, I am actually originally from California. So Northern California, I grew up uh, till I was about 13 there. Then my parents took my little brother and I on a sailboat. We sailed halfway around the world and ended up here in New Zealand. Uh, wow. So that's how I spent my teenage years building a lot of resilience, which helped me in my policing career. Uh, and then didn't actually know what I wanted to do here, brother. I actually was like, kind of like, oh, maybe I'll go work on super yachts. I'll go do some more well, sailing than my wife. Not only <laughs> maybe will you do that. You did that, man, right? I did do you that. I did. You were, what's this show, man? What's the show they have? Below uh, Deck. The, you were the original oh, Below, Below Deck, deck yeah, no, I didn't guy, do bro. That. I, didn't, I didn't do that stuff. I didn't do you that You were stuff, on man. Below Deck. You were. No, I wasn't. In, in no, season wasn't. one. No. <laughs> All right, man. All right, but that's no, what you no. did, man. You brought yachts. Oh, no, around, no right? I wasn't on Below Deck. No, I wasn't on any of that stuff. I ended up not going into the sailing kind of industry after I got here in New Zealand. Uh, I still do yacht racing in that, but. Uh, I met my now wife and kind of was like, well, I need to get a serious job because okay. all the, all the guys who I know that had done sailing professionally were old salty single guys that I was like, I do not want to be that. Yeah. I uh, got you. And so, so then, uh, the, the, the idea of becoming a cop was actually planted by actually my brother-in-law. Uh, he kind of mentioned it one day when we were at his house with his ex-girlfriend and, uh, I was like, Oh yeah, that could be kind of fun. Like bad boys the movie yeah. uh, i think bad boys 2 had not recently come out or it was you know it was pr pretty popular at the moment right. and i was like oh that'd be fun i can do this like swat and and all that and uh so i kind of started inquiring into it and then had it kind of on the back burner because i had to get my eyes lasered i didn't have good enough eyesight uh to join the police force i gotta talk to you about that later yeah and um and so i didn't have quite enough good enough eyesight and was still going down the sailing route a job fell through for my wife and I that I got us on. And so I was like, why don't you, babe, why don't we go to back to the, come back to the U S and I'll show you where I'm from because I had right. some money with my parents sitting there. And so we did. And when we were, when we were there, we were in LA and we, uh, we drove past after a train crash had happened. Uh, and that I watched the first responders and I watched the police being there in the time of need for people hmm. when they were in their most painful place. And I was like, how the hell do I get down there? How do I get down there and help? I even asked my friend that we were staying with, you reckon they'd let me come help if I just rocked up down there? Yeah, <laughs> right. they're like, no, you got to yeah. become one of them to do it. Yeah, no like, doubt. Okay. No, A for effort, you know? Yep. Next next day, I didn't even have running shoes. Next day, I started running because I was not, I was a gym junkie, but not a runner mm -hmm. uh, and started running through the hills of LA where I was staying and looked in the yellow pages because it was before like major, major Google type side of sure. stuff. Yeah. Or I didn't have a phone to Google things, yellow pages. Who can I get my eyes lasered? Called up like six different companies, found the cheapest one, called my mom when I need three and a half grand US to get my eyes lasered. And she went, Are you sure? And I went, Yes, I'll give it, I'll pay you back. And she went, yeah. Okay. The next week went and had my eyes lasered. That's how quickly I was just like, Let's go. 
uh, but I didn't get into the police until that was 2008. Okay. I didn't, uh, 2000, sorry, that was 2009. I believe it was 2008, 2009. I didn't get into the police force. I wasn't actually a sworn cop until 2011. Okay. And not because of myself, but because I just sat on the wait list. So I okay. was determined to make it, man. So you're and back so, in yeah. New Zealand after getting LASIK. Yeah. And you're, yes, I got uh, LASIK. I got LASIK eye surgery about three weeks, about two and a half weeks later. I flew back to New Zealand. Uh, and I got it. I got it in the U.S. because it was cheaper than getting it done here. Okay. Hindsight should have got it done here for any top ups and little things. But okay, hey, I was 23. Yeah, you're 23, time, 22 you, at the time. And you needed to get it done immediately. <laughs> needed to get it done, and I was determined on it. Uh, yeah, came back to New Zealand, started going through the application process, doing odd jobs, doing security work, and that here. Uh, and then, yeah, joined the police force, got in, uh, and absolutely loved it in the beginning. Uh, and then I ended up doing seven and a half years in the police force, uh, all sorts of different things. Spent a lot of the time frontline uh, here in Auckland. I uh, did a stint, a year stint on our version of Highway Patrol, so motorways it's called here. Sure. So our version of Highway Patrol, doing all the traffic stuff, drunk drivers, crashes, going to fatals, all sorts of different you know, as you do on the traffic roads. related, yeah, traffic related stuff, uh, which was quite fun, quite enjoyed that had a good team. And then went back to just before I went to that had a female partner of mine that I was working alongside with, uh, she got assaulted. Uh, as we went to go arrest somebody a guy, um, aggravated assault, it was she was he was trying to escape haymaker her as he went for the front door, uh, and dented her cheekbone, she left the job, and it affected me more than I thought it did. Hmm. Uh, I knew it affected me quite a bit because I took it to heart, uh, but it shifted and changed my whole mindset of people. Uh, and I started, I went from wanting to help people, wanting to make a difference to what's the point? All these people are just going to get given nothing and they're going to have the, the, the common threads that you hear from people. The, right. the criminal system, the, the justice system is, is flawed. The person doesn't get enough. The, I mean, this guy got six months home detention and $500 reparation. Yeah. So when 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 cops in the U.S. complain about people getting stuff, I'm like, come on over. That's here. why that's why we just beat them. We we just that's yeah. why we get in trouble for beating <laughs> yeah, people it's, 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 because the system doesn't yeah, work. So we just figure we'll beat them today, and yeah. then they don't have to go to jail. Oh my yeah. god. Yeah. yeah jokes, I mean, I, jokes. Jokes. I, yeah. I can um, see why that. I can see why that. You can see. Yeah. And so so I I got real sour on it uh because she left the job and i had taken so much of it to heart that it was my fault now honestly it wasn't my fault but um i'd taken it to heart so when i went back to the front line uh from motorways because motorways wasn't so much around that kind of dealing with the criminal criminal it was just you know doing traffic stuff and that and targeting that side of stuff not the assaults not the the real you know nasty stuff as 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 we know sure uh as soon as i went back within a month i went to what was it i want to say it was at least four i think it might have been six suicides uh where the person was it was a fatal suicide right uh and also did of those i did four notification jobs so i'd go to i went to the suicide and did the notification jobs and the notification jobs were just horrendous ones sure and so it just started to concrete and like i'm talking where guys like we're trying to find his son and the guy I had to tell him in the, on the pathway, walking back, he didn't see his son, but, and he collapses. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. and yeah, I mean, you've probably heard, seen him, you know, a lady couldn't even dial her telephone when we went to go tell her that her, um, they were going through a divorce, but that her husband had taken his own life. She couldn't right. even dial a telephone. And then her 16 year old daughter coming down and starting trying to blame herself and me just not being me. Right. Uh, and so those kind of just really created even more of a shell of myself. I didn't feel like I was fit in, fitting in because they're trying to move me around within the station. Uh, and at that point, I was training hard out for our version of SWAT team. Uh, and so fitness was saving my life, keeping good. me sane. Um, good and bad. Fitness can be used as a just like meth. It can be used as a drug. And that's what I was doing. Um, but at least it was a bit more healthy than meth. Yeah, I'm um, glad you didn't turn to meth in that moment. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I'm not, I, I, I'm not a person that goes to the bottle either because I saw the destruction it did to my parents. Good and call. so, 
I went into the gym and I would get angry and I would throw weights around and I look back at videos of my form back then or just look back at what I was just like, no wonder I have so many injuries yeah, 10 years no on. No doubt. Oh. So strict, strict, <laughs> strict and attention to form was not your repertoire, huh? No, it was not. It was just, I'm in here to throw shit around and hit All the right. punching bag as hard as I can. Uh, and so, yeah, so I was do training for that and a friend of mine was like oh you should come and you should come and do the selection for dip mic protection as another option in case you can't get into aos which is our version of swat and i was like oh yeah sweet cool and applied yeah. for it ended up doing that uh did that selection then did the aos selection aos is swat for those that don't know uh and yeah, so I did the selection, didn't get through the selection for AOS because it is very, very, as it probably is over there as well for SWAT. It's very, you know, you got to literally tick every box to the T. Yeah. Uh, but managed to tick every box for diplomatic protection. So I ended up getting qualified and then ended up getting a job at um, within that group at the prime minister's house. I did, then carried on, did that for three and a half years. The thing that I didn't say is that I just took all my demons with me to my protection, oh, yeah, hoping, yeah. hoping that the change of environment would change everything. Well, all it did was make it worse because I went okay. from I went from watching people that drive crap cars, dress like shit and are doing burglaries that match that description. We right. know there's a description that kind of we kind of know, yeah. as cops normally look out for to literally watching everybody and thinking everybody was that enemy. Yeah. I would be at multi-million, I would be with business people that are making millions and millions of dollars watching them going, is this person a threat? Mm. And so I went from having a profile to everybody's my profile and not trusting anyone. That, so much so that, so, that hypervigilance got hyper kicked up, kicked up a few up notches. Like, oh, a few notches, like turn the dial to full and then yeah. break it off. Um so my wife couldn't leave the house without slapping, sort of... slapping the drink out of the prime minister's hand because it might be poison. Yeah. <laughs> like literally that shit would cross my mind. Man. Oh I'd be like, God. I'd be like, shit, could this food be poisoned? Like, oh do we need to check? God. Like, I don't, I like, I mean, you can see the pattern from the very beginning. Of I get course. determined in, of I get determined course. into something and I dive straight into it. Yeah. That's a It's great, but it's a double-edged sword, man. But I, yeah. So it got so bad 2015 that my wife couldn't leave the house without me telling her some sort of thing of watching her back. Um, sure. We came back to the U S end of 2015. I was so burned out and so over it all that I was like, somebody just please give me a job mm. um, so I can get the hell out of here again, trying to escape and not really dealing with my crap. Right. Uh, I had been to counseling, but it didn't really the, the police counselor themselves just fed into whether well, I'll take responsibility. I probably didn't fully open up to everything, but sure. Again, that whole stigma of, is this going to come back on me subconsciously maybe? Uh, but he just fed into go find a, like finding a different job. Uh, hmm. and that's really, the, that's not, that's not dealing with it by the way. No, that's not dealing with your problems. No. I already had, no, it, yeah. that's just running. Yeah, yeah. Life. Well, it's funny that that <laughs> uh, a, a licensed mental health professional would say, "Just find a different job," and that yeah. that'll. Well, I was at the time I was looking at, I was trying to like the idea of taking over my uncle's business because he owns Yates Yates Gear Climbing and Rescue Equipment, so they sell actually a lot of harnesses to SWAT teams, military high ropes guys, and I was like, oh, yeah, I could come back and take take that over. Uh, again, that whole different thing, but not dealing with the underlying stuff, and so right. the 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 he kind of was like my last kind of session was me talking about how i could go back there and have a conversation with him about it hmm. and so you know i uh, so i kind of had that then the end of 2015 i was coming back for a trip to see my grandma and family and even my uncle and that and then i was going on to vegas to do shot show with my uncle with my dad and my uncle because my uncle has a booth there dropped my wife at the airport was out, back in redding california driving from my grandma's house and my uncle's Tacoma and thought I had an early 2000 black Tahoe following me to my best friend's house. That's how paranoid I was. I'm in a different country and yeah, thought well, somebody was you know, following me. You know, when you're doing those black ops, bro, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so much so that I pulled over and like forced the car to like, had to got it so that the car passed me before I, right. and then I took the long way to my best friend's house. I was just like, and, it's not healthy. Uh, and then what was it about six months later, I almost cheated on my wife. 
Okay. Uh, I got so bad that I just wanted some sort of escape. I was at a friend's party. My wife was at an event because she's an event manager. She was, she might've even been overseas. And I found myself literally going through, you know, that process when you're trying to, you know, you see somebody and you're like, oh yeah. I have good. no idea what you're talking about, <laughs> nor do I. Let's I, go back to your 20s. Let's no go back idea. to your 20s, brother. Let's go back Who to the 20s. this? Prank call, prank call. <laughs> yeah. But, right, you know, right. going going through that process of how do I make a move on this woman so that I can sleep with her? Yeah. At a friend's house, it was a friend of a friend. And I was just like, and I still know the lady and still in like we're, because she's a friend of a friend, we're still always, you know, but I caught myself luckily because my parents cheated on each other. And I knew that the destruction that could do my, my wife and I talked in the very beginning, if we ever get to that point, we break it off before we really hurt the other person. And so I literally went home and the next day, I think my wife got home the next day. I went to her, I went, this happened. Uh, I want a divorce. This happened. I almost cheated on you and I'm unhappy. This isn't working. I want a divorce. And my wife loves me so much. And I'll probably get a bit teary here. My wife loves me so much that she went, let's go to counseling one more time because we've put so much into this already. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And she, she could see through that. It wasn't, I, I believe subconsciously and even consciously, she could see through that. It wasn't me because she knows me from before policing. Right. And yeah. And that was the start of the change. She ended up having to go off to a trip for a week and a half. Uh, and then she came back, we got in, we did the counseling session and the counselor, luckily, I honestly, she saved my life. Like, I don't know where I would be now if I didn't have her. Isn't it great? I mean, when you, you think that in the moment, Chris, that nobody can understand, uh -huh. right. You know, that's that other, nobody that, can help. that other narrative we tell ourselves that, my situation is so unique that yeah. there's no way someone's going to be able to help me look at this from a different angle, right? Like I'm done. I've been, my thing was, is I've been to counseling. I've been to two of them. The first one helped my wife more than she helped me. And the second, the second one was the police one. And I was like, I'm yeah. back here. At, I'm even worse. Right. If you're telling me that you like, I, like, I, this isn't my fault. This is all your fault and projecting it out onto everybody else. Uh, and, you know, to be honest, the first the, on that topic that you just said, the first time going to counseling, my wife was asking me what was going on. Uh, my father in law kind of made a comment to her and to my wife and was like, what's going on with Chris? He was at our house and he said no, like said two words over like three hours at our house. Right. Um, but what actually got me to go to counseling the first time was actually talking to another colleague of mine randomly brought it up was like yeah struggling at home with the wife well you know this and that's going on and she went have you talked to the welfare person and i said the who yeah, um yeah. <laughs> right right because <laughs> because you, you you're we're, we're 10 foot tall and bulletproof man yeah. especially in our first couple of years you of mean policing. i might need help yeah. weird i mean need help what no i help people that's yeah, what i yeah. do no i, I don't yeah. have a problem you no I you have, have a problem, problem. You have a problem. Yeah. It's not yeah. my problem. It's your it's your fault wow. that I drink so much or that That's I that great I don't that cheat on you. Your yeah. wife was like so dialed. Yeah, so she so she and something inside of me, and my wife and I have talked about this before. She's asked me a few times. She's like, What was it inside of you that said yes? Like, why did you say yes? And I can't put anything on it besides the fact that I love her dearly. Yeah. And that whole I help people. So if right. she's in pain and going to counseling is gonna help her, okay, cool, I'll do that. Sure. And so we did, we went, we both told the counselor what was going on. And the counselor turns to me and she goes, yes, you both have got stuff going on and your relationship has things going on. But she's like, Chris, you're so burned out. You can't even see where the light is. Mm. And at first I was like, what are you talking about? And then she goes, these are the problem that you're burned out. She's like, these are the symptoms. She, she was like memory loss. She was like lack of focus. She was like lack of enthusiasm. Um, struggling sleeping all that she rattled off every single thing and i was like you know, check, 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 check 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 yeah man and i was like and she's like you need a break like you need to take a break of some sort uh and this is probably over a couple sessions but it all looks like one in my head of course um and so yeah so that we ended up over a few sessions organizing that i would come back to the u.s and do a motorcycle trip uh and refine myself and that's what I ended up doing the day after my 30th birthday. Okay. 
I flew out back to the States. Three months was in the US, two and a half months on the road. Nice. Um, but my wife and I worked through a lot of stuff. We went to a lot of counseling. We had to work through a lot of things because that initially coming back on that trip, I didn't know if I was coming back. I still didn't know if I wanted to be with her at the time. Right. Quickly realized when I got back to the States that I did still want to be with her, that I thought I had yeah. my own shit going on. Right. Um, but yeah, that was, that's kind of my journey to getting to the start of where, of what, of what I do now. Um, because that made me recognize and recently was, again you know like you said in the beginning i'm coming back to the u.s to start doing stuff for law enforcement in the u.s i started meeting people and doing posts on instagram around my journey and doing posts like i was reading back over stuff for, to like kind of prepare for this trip now this year uh i recognize that what i've created now is exactly what i wrote down i haven't looked at those posts since i posted them so things like I want to create a safe place for first responders to be able to, you know, feel like they're heard and be able to speak. I want to, uh, I want to help prevent anybody from feeling like I do right now. Uh, hmm. and the people that I met on that trip, I met some first response, some cops that like, like you, I know you're 30 years on, you know, 30 year career. I met some cops that did 30 years. One guy who flew, uh, flew helicopters in for the sheriff's department in LA. And the way that he talked about things and talked about people, I was like, and this was about four weeks into the trip. I was like, I never, oh, is that me? Mm. Do I sound like that? Because mm. no, I don't yeah, want yeah. to be that person 30 years down the track. Right. And um, yeah, so there's a lot of really good epiphanies. The biggest thing that I took away from that trip and the biggest thing that I can pass on right now in this you know, this far into the pod into the podcast is the biggest thing I learned from that trip is to be open and honest. Hmm. Not everybody wants to hear it. Not everybody's going to like to hear what you have to say, but being open and honest, will get more, you'll get more back from it than anything, especially when we're going through these troubles, these challenges. I wish that I had told my wife everything that was going on. I know there's that whole passing on the trauma stuff but even she and i've talked about it she's like i know where you were standing at least yeah i know what was going on i, I would say i would add one thing to that chris open and honest with you with yourself yeah. with yourself yeah <laughs> but by voicing it out and yeah saying of it course to, saying it to other people it yeah, is man. being honest and when you say stuff out out loud you recognize your own bullshit oh yeah it's easy it, <laughs> it's uh if you play that that record in your head you can start rationalizing all sorts of unacceptable yeah. behavior. And, and uh, when you say it to a loved one who knows you pretty well, yeah, they'll call, they, you know, tell, give them the permission to call you on the bullshit as yeah. well. And it will help so much. The amount of people that I told my story, they'd be like, what are you doing? Because I had a, I bought a V star 1100 cruiser motorcycle. And I had a blue from sailing. I had a blue zip up duffel, like dry bag, duffel bag strapped to the back of the bike. Mm-hmm. So you could tell that I was camping or traveling right, somehow. Sure. I would have people at gas stations ask me. I'd have random people ask me all the time, not even bikers. Just It was just people would ask me what I'm up to. And I would tell them, hey, yeah. I'm a cop from New Zealand. I'm here refining myself because I got PTSD. I'm burned out. I'm trying to figure out what the who the hell I am. Yeah. And people would give you it like they'd be like, oh, wow, you're like, OK, I can relate to that. Yeah, I remember when this happened to me. And. It's amazing. Some, it's absolutely of, amazing because the power of the a power of it. <laughs> yeah. And you just like the amount of fire you know, talks I had over campfires and a beer here or a beer there. A bartender yeah. would ask me what I'm up to. I'd be like, you asked, here you go. <laughs> yeah. Listen, your day just got, is about to get a lot more interesting. Right? Yeah. 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 That's um, awesome. I remember the very beginning of my trip, I was in uh, highway 50 going across Nevada and there was a gas station and a bar slash like burger joint in the middle of like nowhere. Right. And they have all these patches on the wall and I have a photo of it and I took some police patches with me and I was like, Oh, and he asked me like, what I was up to told him what was kind of going on with a little bit of hesitation at that stage. It was very new into the trip. Sure. And then, but I saw the, I saw the patches on the wall. So I was like, this is a safe place because yeah, they obviously, they obviously sure. care. Support and so, law yeah, enforcement. Up, yeah. 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 Support law enforcement, first responders. So I ended up putting a patch up on the wall as well there. So hopefully it's still there, but nice. I'm sure it is. That's awesome. Yeah. So, that's, so you that's went on this, this, this trip, this, yeah. uh, and 
Are you you you're by yourself during this trip? Mm -hmm. So, so I, my plan when I started the trip was let's see where the front tire goes. Initially, I was going to go north. Weather was still bad from from riding California. I was going to go north up into like Montana, Idaho, and that, but it was still snowing and stuff up there. I was like, bike snow, not a good no mix. bueno. No bueno. Uh, and so I ended up, well, okay, I'll go back down south. I've kind of done that area when I was a kid. I'll redo it as an adult. And just went, all I'm going to do, the, I knew I was going to go camp at Diamond Lake in Nevada the first night. And from there, I was like, I'll just keep heading west, see where I go. Hmm. Uh, and ended up forcing myself to talk to people. Yeah. I remember the first guy I talked to was a young kid at a gas station uh, in Nevada toward, at the end of Highway 50. And I was like, oh, you know, I literally hopped back on my bike and then went, no, go talk to him, Chris. You're here to break through the barriers that you're doing right now that you've hmm. been in. Yeah, yeah. So I went and talked to him. I was like, hey, nice bike. You know, again, bikers, you know how it is. I know you sure. ride. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, you're like, oh, nice bike. You know, what are you up to? And he's like, oh, I'm moving from, where is he moving from? He was moving from Oregon to Colorado. And he's like, I've shipped all my stuff, but I'm riding that way. I was like, oh, perfect. I was like, I'm going to stay at these hot pools. And he's like, oh, I think those are closed, but I'm going to go stay at this other one if you want to come join me. So I was like, cool. Yeah, I'll come, to, I'll come with you. The ones that I was going to were closed. There and so we went and stayed at this other one, met some other people, got really drunk that night. Uh, my underwear, it was a hot pool. So my, and my underwear froze on my bike. It was that cold that night. Damn. But I met some new people and that kind yeah, of started did. the whole, everybody's not evil. Holy crap. <laughs> Yeah, how about that? Change your environment. <laughs> Sometimes a change of environment does wonders, doesn't it? it not does, so much, it not not a change of a job, but a change of your physical location, your environment. Yep. With That's a purpose. Awesome. Of course. With a purpose yeah. behind it, you know? Um, yeah, that was, I think, the biggest thing was the change of environment. People don't know me here. I'm doing something that I absolutely love. There's also come to find out research around riding motorcycles and how it calms the brain and does different things along that side also gets you to get laser focused. You have to, otherwise you die. Um, yep. So it stops you from dwelling on everything or dwelling on the conversation that you just had and making up all these different stories. And so it does do a lot of different cool things. And that change of environment was like, okay, I'm here for a purpose. I'm here for one reason. I'm here to better myself. Right. So what do I need to do to do that? I need to get uncomfortable. So yeah. <laughs> so and you had, some conversations <laughs> with a lot of different people all over the yeah. States. Yeah. And you bring that, that, that new Chris comes back to New Zealand. Yep. So he comes, he comes back to New Zealand. Uh, there's still a bit of a, a thing. I actually, so I knew I wanted to connect back in with my wife post then. So I could take that new Chris, bring it back and really just kind of anchor it in, especially within my relationship. Uh, and so we had planned a, Initially, we planned a, a trip to Hawaii because it was like, okay, either this is going to be ending it or it's going to be, um, you know, concreting in that we're going to start a new beginning. Uh, luckily, it wasn't ending it because that would have been awkward to, you know, two right. weeks in Hawaii. Yeah, <laughs> um, not but, so much. Uh, but yeah, so we, we did that. I literally was back in the country, back in New Zealand for less than eight hours and flew back out again. Uh, but yeah, so brought that Chris back and then kind of went, well, what am I going to do now? Because I wasn't quite sure I wanted to go back to policing at the time. Gotcha. I was like, still need to deal with a lot of stuff that policing has quote unquote caused. Um, and so I was like, I'm a better version of myself, but I'm still not truly me. And so I was like, what am I going to do in the interim? Uh, we're lucky here. We can take leave without pay. So I extended my leave without pay, did personal training thought the fitness side because as i said it saved yeah. my life in order to help people um better their mental health through fitness and through training and so it's still a, a, an aspect of what i do uh because it is so important and then that's when i kind of started fumbling a little bit with what i was going to do and then honestly went to a tony robbins event yep uh and it changed stuff just prior to that had a person come to me and go you were a cop. You did some specialty stuff. Can you help me pass my police fitness test? So I took my personal training and I started doing that and fell kind of in love with it. So I started helping people pass their fitness test, a little bit of mindset stuff with that, but mostly it was just the programming side. Then went to Tony Robbins and recognized the power of the mind, hmm. really the power of the mind. Uh, and six days did his date with destiny there in Florida. Uh, six days, six nights, I think it was like seven, 80 something hours over six days. 
we were doing stuff uh and i recognized wow every single cop needs this before they become a cop hmm. because if i had this stuff i would have been a completely well, different cop. and that's so and so that brings me to my my question is i want to be careful in this space what we do because so much of how we stay healthy and as a first responder is being proactive mm. what a lot a lot of times what we do is that inaction and the non-addressing ends up manifesting itself in really negative and destructive ways which you experience firsthand which i experienced firsthand the goal here is i i truly believe this is the best profession in the world it, it is and and if we can just pair up some skill sets that empower our people to address the things that they're they're as sure as the sun rising and setting are going to experience if we can do that proactively then they don't need to suffer in silence for as long as we do um what were some of the things that looking back right you know the the, the beauty of hindsight yeah what could have been some things that you implemented real time during some of those key moments that would have maybe changed the trajectory of your life? Now, knowing knowing that your experiences made you who you are now, yeah. I, I, I'm, I, we're not taking away from that. But what's some things that you would have told your younger Chris Chandler Yates? The the one thing that I would have told my younger self, and it's what I train, because I run a couple of different programs. There's the one that I'm running, you know, coming back to the US, but there's the police fitness prep program that I run, which has a mindset capacity into it. And I teach all my clients this exact thing. And so I'm glad that you asked that because it is so important. I would have reminded myself the reason and the why I want to do this. And I don't know how many people you've talked to that are new into the profession or are just wanting to get into the profession, but I talked to a lot of them. I've helped over 600 of them, 600 of them in the last five years build their fitness. And the number one thing that a lot of people say is I want to help people. That's why I'm going to become a cop. And I turn straight around and I go, that's awesome, but it's a shit answer. Because if you want to help people, well, guess what? There's a local shelter down the road. I'm sure you can go find a homeless person every single day, a new one. That's helping people. So it's great surface level, but it will not keep you in this profession that will chew you up and spit you out. Mm -hmm. And so the one thing that I would teach myself is get laser focused and dig deep into why you want to do this damn profession. Right. Like at a cellular emotional level. Uh, and if I look back, I knew almost the deepest level but it took me a lot of work over the last couple of years to really get to the deepest but the level that i initially started on would have kept me in the job if i had stayed laser focused on it right. that was to create less pain and it all comes down to the reason i went into law enforcement was that train crash i right. saw the pain people were in i saw what cops were doing and they were there for people in their most painful time and go. I wanted to be doing that. And so my sure. first couple of years were in the lines with that. I would spend extra time at domestics talking with the offender. When they're in the back of the patrol car, I'd be sitting there planting seeds in their head. And I look back on this and I go, wow, I like, wow, like I did a lot of that. Right. And then my female partner got assaulted. And I got so wound up with the fact that I caused her pain because I didn't have a clear articulation of it. That that and then and that that guy caused her pain that that's all i could see and that i failed hmm. instead of the fact of i have to create less pain for myself first and then for everybody else and this is causing too much pain for myself so i need to deal with that right yeah that would so have that been then i can cause right less pain yeah, yeah that shift of language that shift of focus that shift of mindset. idea mindset yeah and if I had had that from the very beginning, now to clarify, my why is actually deeper than that. It is actually to truly see myself and the causing less pain is the next level up. But for a couple of years up until about mid last year, 
for about three, four years when I learned this, this um, drove me so powerfully within my business. When things were going wrong, I'd be like, okay, cool. How am I creating pain for myself right now? Okay, cool. I'm doing this and this. Okay, cool. What do I need to do to make that less painful? Mm -hmm. Because then I can turn up to the podcast. I can turn up to my clients and cause less pain for them from a full tank and sure. not feel like they're causing me pain by resenting the fact that, oh my God, I've got to be on this next coaching session. I've got, and this person's a pain in the rear end. No, okay, right. cool. Now, how do I? And so that would be probably, it's the singular most important thing that I believe because then it really helps you to know yourself and bring your true self. Excellent. Yeah, man, it's a great, you know, we figure this stuff out. Thankfully, not too late, right? Thankfully, <clears throat> not too late. But that whole, you know, if I only knew then what I know now, you know, and I, but this is I why said, what we do is so important. This is why the coaching industry has exploded in the last few years is because what we're doing is we're teaching people 30 years of experience and 30 years of our mistakes right? that have gotten us to where we are to somebody who is 30 years behind us so that then they can take 30 years and be even further ahead. Imagine if we knew what we knew now 30 years ago and now, and we're able to then advance from that point, not sure. from the 30 yeah, years. It's all point. about paying it forward, you know, and, and, yeah. and having the people that come behind you be better, <laughs> yeah. be better yeah. because, because you've shared and, and provided some insight, you know, yeah. you've got, you've gotten a peek at the test, you know, and yes, you're sharing exactly. some of the answers. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's the one is, you, you know, you've gone through the struggles and the challenges. It's the same reason we, you know, we hire personal trainers. If we do, it's the same reason, you know, because we want to know how to do it and we want to get it there faster. And there's right. nothing wrong with that. It's actually great. But yeah, the, um, the knowing who you are, really allows you to then be confident in your decisions and what you do what i've recognized a lot from training a lot of people to get into the police force is a lot of people want to be cops because then they think they'll be confident it's like it's like have <laughs> it's like being married being in a relationship or a marriage that is rocky and having a baby to bring you together yes <laughs> yes like, what are you doing <laughs> no i mean the only thing that it's going to do is it's going to be in a full on immersion experience. Yeah. That's what it's going to do. And yeah. so, yes, it will bring more confidence and yes, it can bring you together more if you have that right focus behind it and you right. have the, and so this is where, you know, where mo all of my programming is based around, you know, really knowing why that's so, why my everything's, that's why it's called create from why create from why <laughs> dive into that a little deeper for me, create from why. So yes, You've been doing some amazing things in New Zealand with this program, over 600 clients, um, getting them physically, mentally prepared for one of the most noble of professions. How does that translate now you bring in all that experience and this program to the States? Yeah, so my business, so when I was on that motorcycle trip, uh, the counselor initially had told me, she's like, it's a dark wolf and a white wolf. And they are always fighting with each other. But the light wolf is normally quieter, but has more power than the dark wolf. And the dark wolf is the loud one. It's the negative beliefs. It's the, it's the putting yourself down. It's the feeling like you're not capable of doing things or that everybody's bad. It's the really loud voice that's in our head. And I remember being on the motorcycle trip and it just got really loud at one point. And I was like, can these demons just fuck off hmm. and i was like and then all of a sudden they went quiet and i went knocking demon so my business is actually called knocking demon limited okay i thought you were going to say you looked out over the prairie and you saw a white wolf and then i was going to call <laughs> bullshit bro so that didn't happen so we're we're good not we're good demons. we're good all right yeah so good. my so my business is called knocking demon limited uh and for a long time everything like you can see it if you're watching this on video you can see um, one of the logos uh, behind my head, it's called Knocking Demon Fitness, Knocking Demon Coaching. And for the longest time, that's what I was known as uh, was Knocking Demon Coaching. Uh, and it was because it was all about those demons, overcoming sure. those demons in our heads, you know, so that we can then live with them, not against them. And then we can like, you know, use their power. Uh, and so, but then beginning of the end of 2020, uh, 
I ventured into the, I was already doing the why stuff and really was teaching that and creating that. And then I was like, I want to help not just the fitness side of stuff, but I want to help people really hone into themselves even deeper. And that's when create from why was born because it's all about living a life from that why. Uh, and we had some stuff going on with COVID here and that, and I really had to lean into that. And as soon as I started really leaning into, it, I was like, holy crap, my life is even performing even higher than it was when I was kind of, it was there and I was living it, but I wasn't living it. If you know what I mean? Right. Uh, and so that's when this last year has been, uh, sorry, the end of 2021, it was, uh, and this last year, so 2022, I really have lived in that really honed things in and taken everything that I've learned from training people since the beginning of 2019, mid 2018, but hardcore 2019 till now on the mindset side of stuff, not necessarily the fitness side of stuff, because there's a lot of people out there doing fitness and I can do it, right. but it's like fitness is a part of it, but not honed from the fitness. Uh, and so then I, the create from why came about because it's now create your life from that. Why? Like I want to be seen. I want to truly see what I'm capable of. So I go and I do training. I want to truly see what I'm capable of uh, and help others see what they're capable of. So I coach people. It's that's who I am. And so I live from that and everything that I do comes from that. So it serves me instead of me serving everything else. Hmm. Uh, and so that's where create from why comes from and coming to the States uh, is taking that mindset aspect of living that life from the why. So you truly know who you are so that the fact that as a police officer, the, the, the common thing of the bosses don't get us the political crap, the justice system is, is flawed. The, the, the criminals just going to do it again. All of that stuff is living, not from your why. If you're living from your why, for example, mine, you're living from how am I helping myself and others truly see ourselves. So creating that mission statement to live by that is yours. It is. And it comes from your childhood. It doesn't come from anything else. And it's been concreted in over the years. A lot of times interpreted in a way that kind of can be a bit destructive, but when you reinterpret it and actually now embrace it as a cop, you're now going, okay, cool. So the boss, the politicians don't get us Wait, one, what control do I have of that? Does it line up with my why? Well, no, the reason that it's affecting me is because I feel like they're not seeing me. Okay, cool. Do I want to go through the process of getting them to see me or do I just want to see them? see what they're doing. Okay, cool. They're doing the best that they can. Perfect. What am I here for? I'm here to help the offenders help the victims truly see what they need, see what they're capable of. And that's how it's then that starts serving me. Instead of me feeling like, Oh, my God, these people just don't get it. They're just not doing it. Why? Why don't they just understand? Because all of that is the counter flip side of feeling not seen. Yeah. And so when we shift it on its head and live from ourselves, then we can do it. So it, my program is all about taking cadets, like acad the people in the academy in a self-learning program, but also in a live uh, a couple of times a year, especially in academy slash um, their first two years when they're the most vulnerable and they're the most malleable as such. Sure. So that then they have a concrete foundation because if we don't have a foundation and we're building, building on quicksand. No, nah, it's not going to work. Well, it's not going to work. No. That's um, excellent. And so that's the that's the that's the program and the structure for the for what I'm bringing to the U.S. Uh, here in a couple months. That's awesome, man. Yeah, it 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 kind of reminds me a little bit of that you know that serenity prayer, right? You know, mm. and and it's you know we end up unfortunately getting wrapped up consuming our thoughts and our actions and trying to address things that we don't have control over. And, and, and that's where we lose ourselves. You know, I don't care what the politicians think, what the bosses think. And, you know, none of that matters. I define me. I, I, I make that decision. I'm in charge of me. And um, I think we pat, we pass on that more often than not. And anything that you can do to bring that kind of awareness, I think is, is, is amazing. Well, yeah, it's, you know, and we, we do, we, we do that, but then you add in, the fact that we see, you know, what is it, 18 times as much trauma in our first 12 months as a civilian will in their entire life. Yeah. You add that onto it. And when you don't know who you are, how do you deal with that stuff? Yeah. Like my first day on the job, pretty much it was the first day or second day on the job was a guy who had been passed away for three weeks. You could right. smell him from the street. Sure. 
you know our brains aren't designed not, to see not it. supposed to see stuff like that no you know, and then know. go and eat rice afterwards and if sure. you've ever been to a body that's like that you yeah, know what maggots i'm talking about and, the maggots yeah. and the yeah of course you know and, I still can't smell death and decay. My wife has to tell me to take the trash out because my nose won't smell it Yeah. from that day. Yeah. That is a trauma response, which I didn't recognize until literally a few years ago. Sure. But when we know who we are, like I can recognize now, okay, cool. It, that was like the very beginning. So I was living from my why subconsciously of right. truly seeing looking around. I can remember everything that's going on. I can remember the passport that we found and going, okay, cool. Yeah, sweet. I get this guy. I, I feel bad. Like actually process the fact that I feel bad that this guy's been left here for three weeks and his family hasn't come around. Like that actually kind of hurts a bit right. and actually being able to process that. Um, and also I remember that he had awesome Ducati's downstairs. He was a motorcycle collector. He was, and right. so, so you can process that trauma better. The next, next one that I went to that, that was major trauma as a, what people refer to so as say, trauma. How much, how much, how much did you get the Ducati's for? that's what he did he donated those to charity i was like he donated, the, he donated them to the one? chris chandler yates foundation <laughs> that would have been nice that would have been nice oh they were my like goodness old school, they were like old school like 50s 60s ducati like i'm talking like classics amazing I was, these are like yeah but yeah the next job was a guy from um left from a domestic he had an argument with his missus and he went and jumped from a train yeah and recognizing that, yeah, the bodies didn't affect me as such as I thought, but it's going, okay, the fact that this guy didn't feel seen, okay, how do I process that? Right. Because I'm, again, I'm relating it to me and my why, because I can't relate it to you and your why, because I don't know what yours is and I'm not you. Right. But when we know this, it actually helps us process that trauma and not hold on to it. Like you take the notification jobs, the, 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 I mean, I was in a dark stage, so this is why it affected me so much more because by this stage, I wasn't living from my why. Watching a guy that's my dad's age collapse to his knees when I told, had to tell him that his son passed away. Yeah. And just putting my hand on his back and just kind of standing there and not really doing a whole lot. I now recognize why that affected me so much because I wasn't helping him be seen. I wasn't helping him truly see that this is going to be okay. Right. I just was like, I'm a staunch cop. I just have to stand here. And you stand. weren't, you weren't helping him with, uh, you know, you weren't keeping him from pain. Yes. By, and I wasn't by... keep, the next level. I wasn't keeping him from pain. I wasn't keeping him. Yeah, I wasn't yeah, bringing yeah. excitement to him. And so those, all my emotional levels of my, why my purpose were not being met. And so what did it do? Spiraled me more. Yeah. It drained me more. It caused me to burn out more. It caused the PTSD. It caused that to stick and ingrain into my head. So much so that I can close my eyes and still still see it like it was yesterday. Right. Yeah. Because I'm I wasn't living and serving that and doing everything that I felt I could do for that. And that's not you know that's just from experience and not knowing these things. Right. Whereas once you know this and you go, okay, cool. How do I relate this to it? You turn it into a question. You live by that mission. How all the police forces have a mission statement. You're right. You know, for the longest time, I don't know if they still do, but had protect and serve on the side of the vehicle. That was the mission statement. That's the mission, protect and serve, protect and serve. When we're living by that, as a cop, you feel like you're winning. Now, imagine if you had your own one that you applied to protect and serve. Right. It's a game changer. It's a game changer. And so this is how you prevent burnout. You prevent the, the well, burnout causes sick leave. It causes use of force complaints. It cause, because at that stage, I was like, I'm here to smash heads, take names, and lock people up. Yeah. And that doesn't yeah, help. No, it's about community. adding it? value and quality to our lives and yeah. redefining that mission statement so it aligns with our why is really key. Yeah. Exactly. And so it, it, it literally changes, it changes the dynamics of how cops work. And if you can do it in the beginning, I mean, yes, you can do it and you can shift people. It takes a lot more practice, just like you tear a bicep. How long does it take to, you know, repair? Whereas if you're actually good with it, it can get strong, it can, you get it stronger way faster. Uh, so it's the same thing. My thing is all about that preparation. And I know you're on the same page that so let's prepare them for what they're going to see and to deal with it. So it's got to be then, proactive, man. It's got to yeah. be proactive. It's the only because it's then the it's, only way. Then when some then when something happens, you already have that foundation. It's easier to lean back on it. Hey, listen, it's gonna have. We're all gonna experience the slide. Yep. 
cannot ex not experience the slide. Slide's going to occur. What we want to do is to keep the slide from turning into an avalanche. Mm -hmm. And if we have an avalanche, everybody dies in an avalanche. Avalanche, nobody nobody comes destroys out. Destroys everything. It destroys everything. So let's catch it at a slide. Um, yep. You've got another. You've got another motorcycle trip coming up. Called, I do. Um, lean into it. Tell me about lean yep. into it. So lean into it came from it was it, the idea sparked the beginning of 2022 because i was like i love motorcycle riding the last few trips that i've done with the boys have been absolutely amazing but i want to teach the things that i teach while we do it because while you ride you have time to focus on it and really ingrain it into your head and so i luckily have a wife who's an event manager so she's helped me do all the logistics some of the logistical side on the other side but it's all around helping people recharge. I mean, the last three and a half years or whatever it's been has been a brutal nightmare for both law enforcement, business professionals. Uh, but it's all about recharging yourself. So it's all about growth, re ride, growth and recharge. Uh, yes. And so we're gonna we're gonna go through a little things, nothing too heavy, but we're gonna go through some stuff each day. So that while you're riding, you have stuff to kind of reflect on in that because we know when you're a you and your helmet, you reflect on things whether you want to or not. Right. Uh, and so get you really get that kind of messaging targeted. So you do that. Plus, also, it's about bringing people together. Uh, so far, uh, at the time of this recording, we've, it's about half full. We've still got about five positions, five places left. Uh, and the people that are coming along are business professionals. We've got some border, some first responders, a border patrol officer all coming to bring their value as well so there's some great networking so Absolutely. if you are looking to getting out of place any and you're in law enforcement or first responding and you're looking at getting out great connections or people sure with people my mentor is coming along which is amazing because he he's he's helped me get to where i am now yeah, um, right. when it comes to business he might know so, a few things yeah i might know just a couple few things that's uh, awesome but yeah so it's it's all about helping people recharge and regrow there's studies that have gone out you know you they use horses a lot for, uh, and I learned this from the guy that we're renting stuff from. He kind of turned me onto it, and I, I found the the papers and that on it. They use horses as therapy animals for different people. One because they're calming, uh, and two because of the movement and the jar, the movement of the head and the the rocking motion. A motorcycle is not far off of that. A motorcycle, you still rock the head. You have weight on your head with your helmet and it rocks. And what it does is it re kind of programs the reticulating activating system at the base of the brain because you're moving cerebral fluid through the base of the brain by it moving around. Mm -hmm. And so it helps calm you as well. So if you're stressed out, if you're, this is why everybody who rides motorcycles, is like, oh my God, I feel so much better after the ride. Plus also Harley Davidson um, did a, uh, finance a study with UCLA on motorcycle riding and the difference between motorcycle riding and driving. They did the same route on a motorcycle and, and, and a car and put a, one of those funky looking things on the people's heads and underneath their helmet uh, and read their signs of like cortisol levels and did blood tests and that cortisol levels and stress hormones and the focus and all that on people. And they reduced stress by 20% just by going for a ride. Hmm. So then you put intention behind that and you put sure. learning behind that. And all of a sudden now you're concreting foundational things in for when you're not on the bike. Absolutely. Yeah. That's interesting. And so that's what the ride's all about. It's all about. When is the ride? Chris. So the ride is on the 20th of May. Okay. Uh, so it's the 20th of May till the 26th full VIP. So literally it goes from Sedona, Arizona. Uh, we're going up through Utah, Colorado, the South end of, of Colorado through New Mexico and back to um to new Me back to sedona hitting some places that i went to that made some real changes for me cool. um there's a there's a place that i'm really looking forward to taking people to it just a really calming um experience uh and yeah so full vip bike hire food gas um we've got a support vehicle in case something happens with one of the bikes so we have that covered uh and yeah all you need to do is bring yourself bring a good attitude nice and we'll have a lot of fun that's awesome. If um if folks want to find out more about that event or more about what you're doing with with your uh, knocking demon coaching and and all that, where where can we find you, Chris? 
So uh, a couple of places, uh, LinkedIn's really good. It's just Chris Chandler hyphen Yates. Uh, Instagram, I'm on Instagram a lot. Uh, that's just Chris Chandler Yates, all one word. And then uh, the website uh, and the lean into it, ride is under up underneath retreats. Uh, it's just createfromy.com. Createfromy.com. Uh, yeah, that's, that's awesome. the one. Hey, um, Chris, if there's one thing, man, one thing that you'd like to leave the listeners with, man, they're 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 getting off shift or they're getting ready to come in and they're in their cars and they're listening to this podcast. What's something that you'd like to leave them with brother? Take a deep breath. Just breathe. Breathe. Guess what? You're alive. If you're driving home from your shift, you're alive. If you're driving to your shift, you're alive. Just breathe. It's the greatest thing in the world. So how many people didn't wake up this morning? Right. So breathe and shift your focus to where you want it to be. You do that every single day, every moment you feel like you're getting distracted, every moment you feel like you're you're getting off course. Take a big deep breath. I mean, who is it? Uh, Navy SEALs talk about what well, we talk about all the time as well, tactical breathing. Do some box breathing. Just take a breath, big deep breath all the way in, exhale out, and shift your focus to where you want it to be, not where the, the world and media and everybody else is pushing you you'll be a much better person straight afterwards. You'll feel way better. Not a better person, but you'll just feel better straight afterwards. That's awesome, bro. That's something we can do right away. We can do that right now, man. We yeah. can do that right now. You can do that Ladies any and... moment. Huh? You can do yeah, that in any, any moment, moment, you know? Yeah, you, you, you have, you're having a struggle. You can do it when people don't even notice it. You can be at a difficult job and you can be like, crap, this job sucks. This person is such an idiot. Whatever it is that's going through your head, and you can be like, there you go. What am I doing here? All right. Uh, I'm here. I'm here to. I'm here to make a difference. Okay. Cool. Let's go. There you go. Split second. Make a difference. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Chandler Yates. That's the one, brother. Thanks for taking the time, brother. I appreciate you. Thank you, and I want to say thanks to everybody. I want to thank you for doing what you're doing. Uh, and I also want to thank everybody out there. And I want to thank, I know at the time of this recording, it's national law enforcement day. That's so what they tell to, me. That's what they say. That's what they say. That's what I saw. On, that's what I saw on social media. So it must be true. Um, but, uh, I want to thank everybody out there that is, you know, that is still out there protecting us, still suiting up that vest, whether you be fire, ambo, police, military. Um, thank you for getting out there and doing the hard yards. Um, we're here to support you and yeah, reach out anytime you need with anything. Um, my phone's always on. My emails are always answered. That's awesome, man. Thanks for taking the time, brother. Thank you.